Hi, I'm Othias, and this is the Belgian Gendarme pistol model of 1877, one of the weirdest military handguns to see actual adoption in significant numbers. Uh, before I explain how, let's get it over to the light box. Weighing in at 2.5 pounds and with an overall length of 10.4 inches. Uh, hold up. Okay, yep, I double checked. It is 10.4 inches long. Technically, on the diagonal, this thing is like 12 inches, so maybe a bit misgiving on that length. Anyway, uh, we have a magazine capacity of zero because we have two barrels with two chambers and we load directly into them, making this a two-shot pistol. That, of course, being the 9.4 millimeter Nagant pistol cartridge. Don't forget, today's show is brought to you by the letter P for patrons. You can join us on Utreon or Patreon and receive the behind-the-scenes podcast. And for those of you who stretch just a little bit, we have a monthly scan of a historical firearms-related document. They are pretty cool, if I'm being honest. Today's episode is something of a prequel, because due to our World War I focus, we have already seen a fair few firearms from the brothers Nagant. Today, however, we're going to rewind way back, past the 1895, past the Belgian service revolvers, to their first Marshall handgun. But of course, we should probably talk about the Nagants. Emile Jerome Michel, born in 1830 to a Liège lawyer named Charles Joseph Lambert Nagant, would be an older brother by just three years to Léon Henri. And sadly, that's about all we know of their early life or even education. Neither brother apparently followed in their father's footsteps into the legal profession, nor did they become gunsmiths like we'd usually expect from Liège. Instead, according to their later sales literature, in 1859, the two brothers would found their own industrial repair company. However, being located in Liège, easily one of the great small arms invention capitals of the world, they would soon be working heavily with firearms, either directly or on equipment that makes firearms. It is speculated this began as a combination of uh, parts manufacture and repair of existing products. The first complete firearm we see from the Brothers Nagant would actually be a design from the US. Following the death of his father, US arms maker Samuel Remington became president of the newly incorporated family business. In his new role, Samuel began touring Europe and apparently met with the brothers Nagant. While we don't have any paper contracts which might reveal the exact dates, it seems both Samuel and his brother Eliphalet III would begin working closely with the Nagants, hammering out a license agreement and helping establish quality manufacture specifically in Europe for rapid contract fulfillment for their then new Marshall rifle. The Remington Rolling Block, an extremely simple and robust breech loader that would eventually dominate the market. The first Nagant manufacturer contract would be for the Pope. This was, of course, during the time of Italian unification, particularly when the Papal States were duking it out with, well, Italy. Catholics around the world raised funds and arms for the Papal States, and the Belgians were no exceptions. While there's a bit more detail to the story, it's not our core point today. Just know that the Brothers Nagant began producing rifles for the Pope in 1867, an initial order for 5,000 long guns followed by a request for more and then some carbines. Fabrique de Armes Emile et Léon Nagant was fully underway. Being new to the firearms business, it's no surprise that most of their first products would just be variations of the Remington Rolling Block rifle. But innovation would soon follow. In time, the Brothers Nagant would uh, begin patenting their own unique improvements. The first of these would be a retraction mechanism for the firing pin. This was an improvement over the original floated design, but strangely was not integrated into our gun today. More interesting to us is this double barrel design from 1870. It is essentially two rolling blocks smushed together, two hammers, two sears, and two triggers, but with a unified breech block. In July of 1871, they would be approved for yet another patent relating to, well, you guessed it. Now, sadly, I don't have a copy of this one on hand, but it covered two versions of an improved extractor system for the Remington rolling block. Interestingly, Remington would later target the same problem with their early rifles using their own somewhat similar improved extractor, which positively kicked out the spent casing. The Brothers Nagant also applied this improved extractor system to their twin barrel rolling blocks, fitting it in between the chambers so that it would simultaneously eject both cases. Other patents would, of course, 
really start to flow, but for our episode today, the most critical would come in September of 1876. It covered an interesting method for fitting a double barrel firearm with a singular trigger. Just cock either hammer or both, and the trigger will always drop just one at a time. This was accomplished by a horizontally pivoting transfer arm. Now this patent would see an improvement filed in the summer of 1877, but sadly we've been unable to locate that one in time for this episode. For those of you familiar with European sporting arms, all these patents point towards the potential for some very fine double barrel shotguns and maybe some double rifles. And there are some lovely and usually rare and expensive examples of Nagant sporting long arms. But today's show is about a pistol. So how the hell did all these ideas clearly geared towards you know, big sporting guns get turned into a frankly awkward looking martial handgun? Well, actually a fair bit of that is still shrouded in mystery, but here's what we do know. During the 1860s, firearms technology was changing rapidly and the results were showing on the battlefield. Events like the American Civil War had firmly established two technologies in the minds of military men. The multi-shot pistol, which was usually in the form of a revolving pistol, and all small arms were rapidly moving towards breech loading with metallic cartridges. At first, with a mix of pin fire, rim fire, or even weirder cases, but eventually settling on center fire, which we still enjoy to this day. The various Prussian wars of the time, stepping stones to the unification of Germany, would prove to be a strong driver of European nations leaping to adopt their own modernized small arms, usually beginning with their rifles. Belgium would solve that particular problem with their 1867 adoption of the Albini Braindlin, and then the 1868 Tursen until the Albini's extractor could be fixed. Both of these, by the way, were methods of converting existing muzzle loaders in order to keep the process economical. With the rifle problem solved, the Belgian army could establish a commission to investigate the possibility of adopting a revolver, and did so in 1869. This matter apparently dragged on for some time and wouldn't be resolved until about 1877-78. But that's getting a bit ahead of our story because our pistol isn't even a revolver. So again, what the heck happened? Well, it was the Belgian gendarmerie apparently. These guys were a paramilitary national police force established in 1796. For the Belgians, the Gendarmerie came along with French rule. It briefly changed names to Marechaussee during Dutch rule, but came back as Gendarmerie after the revolution in 1830. The force would largely remain the same, albeit with further refinement and better training on into the early 1870s, which is when it would see some updates to keep in line with the rest of the military. In 1873, they'd receive their own breech-loading carbine, again built on the Albini Braindlin system. Now, just to further narrow our focus, this episode is primarily concerned with the mounted gendarmerie, who apparently carried a pair of percussion pistols on their saddle. With the adoption of the new carbine, these pistols were now more clearly out of date. However, the Army Commission was taking its sweet time finding a suitable centerfire revolver. Now, we know that this matter would ultimately result in the Nagant model of 1878, a revolver we've covered before, but this was taking a lot of time. With other nations rushing to the wheel gun, it must have seemed to some that Belgium was being left in the dust. And for a police force, it might have been unnerving to be well behind the civilian market. So it seems the gendarmerie became determined to adopt their own updated pistol. Sadly, the exact negotiations or even trials which led to this particular handgun here, have been lost. But we can certainly make a few educated guesses at why this gun emerged. Uh, first and foremost, this is a rolling block pistol, and Nagant was a rolling block firm. Given the later adoption of the Model 1878, it's likely they were already working on a revolver even as this pistol emerged. But there was also likely a cost issue there for a force like the Gendarmerie. Or perhaps there was a training and potential accident risk that made them want a pistol which worked more like the old percussion model or even like their single shot carbines. Regardless, it seems Nagas submitted this awkward looking but rather robust two shot pistol in order to fulfill the gendarmerie's unique needs. And honestly, that two shot feature makes a lot more sense when you realize a single Nagant pistol would be replacing the two percussion pistols mounted
mounted on the saddle. So two pieces in order to get two shots replaced by one and even more rapidly loaded. Nope, absolutely fulfills the minimum requirement, which again sounds very cost conscious to me. Now the pistol was paired with the Belgian Army's first official centerfire pistol cartridge, which despite not having a gun to chamber, it was already chosen after a comparison of options ranging from like nine to 12 millimeters. Ultimately, the winner was a cartridge manufactured by Louis Bachmann of Brussels, likely at the request of the brothers Nagant. Sporting a slow moving, small diameter bullet, it was a milder, but still effective choice. It was expected to perform its duty well up to 50 meters, and of course at this time was driven by a black powder charge. While I'm still unsure what competed against this design, if anything mind you, it seems it proved acceptable, being purchased in 1867 and receiving official designation in 1877, making this the gendarmerie pistol model of 1877. So I guess it's time to get a closer look at what the heck am I holding, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I love this gun. There's nothing that I have seen ever quite like it. I mean, it doesn't even look like certain single shot pistols because look at this height. This is the most incredible height I have ever seen on a pistol in this show so far. Absolutely wild. And then it's almost taller than it is long. And then it's just two rolling blocks stuck together. Uh, let me make sure you can see this. Two rolling blocks stuck together with two hammers, one breech block, and shrunk down to a pistol. This is fantastic. Now, in order to use this pistol, you would have both hammers at full cock. Oh, good Lord, these are stiff and I am not left-handed. But you would carry it in your left hand uh, for loading and unloading because they put the tab for that on the right. So the idea was to take it off your dominant hand, put it in your non-dominant opener up, and then grab your ammo. So I have two dummy cartridges made up. These are not live. We'll put them in each of the chambers, close her up, and that's it. You are now ready to rock and roll. With the gun ready to go, we have one, two firing pins for our two hammers. These are both floated. They actually rest on the primers of the cartridges. Since I have dummies in place, I can go ahead and recess these as if they had been set off. And I want to do that because I don't want to smack them unnecessarily when I dry fire this guy. So right hammer will drop first with the pull of our, the first pull of our singular trigger. It's a long take up and then it gets very, very heavy and slap. When I release the trigger, we auto rebound. Then I pull again, a uh, very short take up, fair bit lighter and boom. And we have an auto rebound. Now the right hammer is almost always locked when in this rebound position. The left hammer, I just want to point out, this is not a uh, half cock position, like a safety position, because I can pull the trigger and it slacks the left hammer. So they're really just sort of held there under, I guess, mechanical tension. So why this rebounded position? The obvious answer to me is that you would be able to load this guy up with live ammo, close it up, and then ease both hammers to this position such that you can now carry it around and cock them as needed. The only problem with that is you could do that with a manual rebound that would actually lock out the trigger, except of course this mechanism is a little wacky for being able to do that. Why they made it automatic is still a little bit of a mystery to me, but at least it functions in the way that you would hope for being able to carry it around hot. Focusing on the singular trigger, we can kind of see how this operation works. So if I cock the left hammer, you can see that this little sear right here that's actually visible from the outside index back a little bit, snap. If I were to really push on this guy as, as hard as I can, we'd actually probably would be able to trip that hammer. So I guess don't whack it exactly there, but apparently it wasn't a big problem. Now I want you to pay close attention to this little guy here, this sort of lug looking thing. I'm gonna pull back the other hammer. And as I do, see it indexing? It's actually walking back and it's retracted far enough that should I pull the trigger now, I won't make contact with the left sear at all. So whenever the right hammer is back, you cannot contact the left sear and therefore the trigger pull will only drop the right hammer. If the right hammer is down, 
and the left hammer is back, well, that's good news for you because you're going to be able to, so let's go ahead and drop that right hammer. And as we come up, watch this guy pop up, pop. Now he will trip that other seer and drop the left hammer. It's a pretty ingenious little system that we'll see better in our animation. Now with both of our rounds spent, we need to eject them. So we'll go ahead and cock back both hammers and we'll open this guy up. Now I'm doing it gently, but you would honestly probably want to do it with a little more gusto, but I want to be able to show you what's going to happen because down this center piece, so rotating point for the breech block, rotating point for the breech block, this is a separate rotating component, which houses an extractor right here in between the two barrels. And once we get to the point that there's resistance on this guy, once we're getting to the point where we're three quarters of the way back on the pull, when we have a nice downward sweep, the last little bit to go, that's when it's finally going to tip and it's going to eject these two cases. And when they're fitted properly, it's actually quite satisfying. Now, in theory, this guy has a takedown function. Uh, I'm actually already engaging it because uh, <laughs> removing this one screw requires three hands and a vise, given the spring pressure that's in effect on this action. But it is only one screw in order to get into the lock work somewhat. So I went ahead and did it off camera. And if we look at the front of the gun, we can see that there's a relief cut to allow us to essentially tip the whole action open. At which point we can oil and maintain as needed without having to fully strip the gun. However, there's still not a lot of room to work and we can't see a ton of the interior. So we'll probably save the rest for Bruno. And finally, if you're curious if the Nagant 1877 that you're holding is actually from the Gendarmerie, well, you can check on the butt because there should be a W, which stands for apparently Gendarmerie in the uh, Belgian Armed Forces. Now, I know for a fact you're going to want to see this lock work in action. So let's get a quick look inside with Bruno's X-ray spectacles. Today, we have something different for sure. At its heart, this is really just two rolling blocks stuck side by side. So let's start with the basics. Before we can even load our pistol, we'll need to cock back both hammers. Starting with the right, pay attention to the sear, which will snag on the rearmost of two notches when at full cock. Here on the left side, we again have a hammer to cock back with its own independent sear. With the hammers back, the breech is now free to rotate. However, it is biased into one of two positions by this spring-powered lever. As we roll open the block, note its teardrop tip crosses the lever, shifting the bias to the open position. Now we can load our two rounds and close the block, which biases back to closed. It is, however, not locked shut at the moment. Inside the block are two floating firing pins. These must be struck with some force by either of the hammers to discharge the pistol. We can do that now by pulling the trigger which tips the sear and releases the right side hammer to fall, discharging the right barrel. Pulling the trigger again causes the left hammer to fall, discharging the left barrel. Each hammer also prevents the breech block from being able to rotate, locking it shut. We must retract both before we can open the breech. Set inside the breech block is the extractor. As we rotate the block open, the extractor is still unaffected until the slot in the breech block bottoms out on a lope on the extractor, at which point it pivots and snaps the cartridges out of their chambers. The only safety in the firearm is a half cock notch on each hammer. Both can be lowered singularly into the half cock position. Here, the breech cannot be opened and the trigger cannot be pulled. You must recock the hammers manually to ready the pistol. The Nagant's ability to use one trigger for both hammers comes from this ingenious selective transfer lever. Its rear is sprung to project outwards to the left side of the gun. However, when the right hammer is cocked, its inner wall presses on the front of the lever, keeping its rear teetered inward. That means if the right hammer is cocked, pulling the trigger will not influence the left sear. Instead, only the right sear is tipped and the right hammer falls. When the right hammer is down, the transfer lever is no longer under pressure at its front, so the rear springs outwards to the left. This places the rear of the projection of the transfer lever in between the trigger and the left sear. Now pulling the trigger tips the left sear, causing the left hammer to fall. So in short, this system will always manipulate the right sear, but will only manipulate the left sear if the right hammer is down. All right, that should just about cover it. Definitely one of the most unique firearms on the show so far. Let's go shoot it.
<laughs> doot doot. <laughs> you know, May was a big fan of rolling blocks. I wonder how she feels about them as a pistol. Thanks to the gendarmerie's contract, this became the first official Belgian military metallic cartridge pistol. However, the contract agreement appears to have been lost to time. We don't know how much they paid, and we're not entirely sure how many were ordered, actually. Serials seem to range, apparently, from 1 up to 2,200 or so. And strangely, a major change seems to have been made at roughly the halfway point. This is the early version, same as our pistol today, and apparently much more commonly found in the American collector's market. But this iteration appears somewhere around serial number 1050. Here, the upper frame assembly is now one piece, and on the underside, the forward screw has been recessed. Unfortunately, we don't know why these changes were made, or when. Perhaps they represent a second order for the gendarmerie. Sadly, I can't prove a thing. It appears, however, that there was some sort of overlap in the designs, as this pistol right here, being of early construction, is serialized 1100 on the dot. And, yep, no changes. Now, in service, this was supposedly still carried in a saddle holster, which is probably why we never seem to find them with any leather. And while we're talking accessories, it seems the 1877 was issued with a cleaning rod, but not an oiler or a screwdriver. That's because they were issued alongside the carbine, and so were made to use its screwdriver and, of course, share the oil. While we don't have any service reports, it's pretty likely the 1877s developed a uh, particular mechanical problem during their service lives. The clue to this problem comes from this particular screw, because it was not included in any depiction of the pistol in the original 1878 manual, and yet here it is today. As a matter of fact, if I flip this guy over, we can see that where he comes through on the other side, there's actually an old inspection mark that has been sort of damaged, bored out, and threaded for the screw itself. So this was definitely an addition after the fact. Also, it's worth noting that I've observed examples of the second type, in other words, the unibodied uh, 1877, that also have the screw cutting through an original inspection mark. So therefore, it seems like this was done after both versions had already been produced and put into service. Unfortunately, we have no record on the date. The work was probably done at, let's say, uh, MAT, or perhaps even a smaller factory workshop, because it's not that complicated of a maneuver. But what exactly was it doing? Well, I don't have any fanciness to show you at the moment, but you have to imagine the two springs that are in here powering these hammers, and when they swing up, they swing up with a tremendous amount of force, and on occasion they apparently were flexing, and getting past the hammers, and therefore jamming up the whole system, making the pistol useless. Now you could further extend all the hammers in service. You could further extend all the mainsprings in service and work out the geometries for that. Or you could pop a screw right through the frame, and it would block those guys a little bit uh, lower down, boonk, and prevent them from over-traveling, which is a much simpler process. Ultimately, these pistols would serve from their first issue in 1878 until they were replaced in 1901. That would be thanks to John Browning's FN 1900 32 ACP pocket pistol. Following which, they would be sold as surplus, apparently to the firm of Jules Pierre. Uh, their 1906 catalog lists the pistols at a price of 9 francs as is, or 12 francs re and cleaned up nicely. However, uh, it seems they weren't quick sellers, uh, as at some point most were shipped over to the US, the vast majority of these guns now remain in the uh, US collector's market. Near copies would actually also be produced by other Liège gun makers. These were of varying quality in a mix of features. Some were even made from parts recovered from the closure of the Nagant factory later on. That means the 1877 actually outlasted the brothers Nagant themselves, uh, despite being such an obscure little oddity. And speaking of our inventors, we actually already have more episodes that cover their further exploits. However, it's important to note that the 1877 was their first handgun sold to the Belgian government, setting them up for many years of dealings and building the foundation for their eventual fame in that department. All right, I suppose that covers this guy for today, a fairly straightforward gun that still has a lot of mystery in its history. Well, while we wait for researchers to unearth more secrets, we can at least go visit with May and get her opinion on actually firing this really wacky looking handgun. All right, once more, I've made room for May. He did. He actually moved his chair over to the right. And we have room for, I I want to say one of the largest handguns we've ever had, but it's not, but it is. Maybe 
the most boomerang like. <laughs> it's kind of boomerang shit. Yeah. All right. I, I don't you. think I don't recommend trying it out as a boomerang, but it is the most boomerangy. All right. All right. All right. All right. Let's go for ergonomics fast on this thing, right? Because okay. the Nagano 1877 is buck wild, right? I'm not going to hand it to you yet. I mean, okay. Look at it. So, that is not a revolver. Mm -hmm. That's not a semi-automatic pistol. Right. It looks more like a Remington rolling block in the form of a handgun. How long does it take your brain to figure out that this is a double-barreled Remington rolling block? Does it come so across if you hold, quickly? Wait, hold it profile. Just to hold like it this? profile. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, that won't necessarily tell me that because... I can't see their two hammers. I can't see their two barrels. Okay. But, but you, it does look like it's wider than it should be. And it definitely has... Okay, so we can see the rolling block in this. Because mm -hmm. we have the rolling breech, the hammer, and we definitely have the rolling block double pin assembly. Right, yes. Okay, so rolling block. And then I yeah. tip it over. And you're like, dude, it's got two barrels with one trigger. And that's actually the thing that cracks me up the most is because I've got two barrels with one trigger on that. Mm -hmm. That's my first experience on that with this show. I mean, I've personally experienced that many times before in my life, but this is my first time having it on the You've show. You've done a lot of single trigger double barrels? Aren't you a fancy person? I'm not that fancy. It's just I have a bunch of friends who shoot old shit. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> I will say before I even put this in your hands, I have never pulled this thing out around uh, gun guys okay. and not had them immediately start Love? laughing okay. like there's there's almost like a, <laughs> they can't contain it right there's, there's humor about just looking at this thing uh-huh all right so now i'm gonna put it in your hand okay close your eyes okay you put it in your hand i can't put it in your hand if you don't. <laughs> okay are you still you're gonna do it blind well i'm just doing this thing where i'm like you put it in my hand i'm thinking all right, so clearly, all right, there's the knuckle right there. Okay, mm -hmm. I can feel that. It's a pretty comfy grip. Where, how far down, how big is my hand supposed to be that I might be gripping down, that someone has the span to go all the way down here? I can get my whole hand on there and still have room. Yeah, there's a lot of bottom grip. Why? I mean, unnecessarily so. Is I mean, was it in a, a holster of some sort that it was tucked that deep in that you would sure, need to... I have a big hand, <laughs> and there's an inch of extra grip. For a glove, maybe? Would you be if you had a gloved hand? I could sort of see that being useful to have that extra. You still length. got at least three quarters of an inch of extra grip. It is wild. I don't. I don't get that. So that seems weird to me. The knuckle feels a little bit uh, soft. I want to say when I come in here, like mm -hmm. that feels like a really gentle knuckle. It's almost like you can ride out of it. Yeah, I kind of feel like I could easily slip if I've got enough recoil to okay. it. But anyway, okay. How's the so, trigger? Is it a good spot? Uh. Surprisingly, yeah, but the thing is, look how high up on grip. I just can't get over that. Like it, it feels like it's but in a good place. Are you gripping high? Because you're, you're measuring up the, the bottom knuckle. of the grip. Yeah, no, I keep going off the bottom, and you're not wrong. I'm actually with the knuckle, which feels mm -hmm. almost pretty linear with that trigger. It now, looking feel too at the rest bad. of the action, would you say your grip is <clears throat> high or low? I'd say it was perfect for at least being able to reach, because I still have to reach over the knuckle to reach up to the hammers. Okay, so can you cock those hammers one handedly? Mm, so Oh, oh, that looks. Oh, it's very. Uh, they're very heavy. <laughs> they're very heavy. Why are they that heavy? I guess they had really hard primers. And then I'm assuming, like by the way, I, I flipped this open. I'm able to reach, just barely reach that. By the way, with my my. Thumb. Yeah, it's designed to be carried in your left hand for loading and unloading. Yeah, no, it definitely is. That's just too awkward to do. I don't know if they hand. expect you to cock with the other hand or not. Um, oh God. The way it's set up, it has an auto rebound on the hammers, which I assume because there's no need, there's being not a revolver, there's no need for an auto rebound except to make it an automatic half cock position essentially, mm -hmm. which would mean you could load the gun, close the breech, and then mm -hmm. lower the hammers. Although, boy, you got to remember which hammer when there's a live round in there. Oh yeah, definitely. It's always the right one first, guys. Um, and then you could ease the hammers and they would stay in the rebounded position and that way you could carry chamber ready and cock as needed. Oh God. But Cocking those quickly on the fly when they're <laughs> that heavy seems a bit rough. It would almost be faster to leave them both cocked and the breech open and just shove two rounds in and close it and fire than it would be to cock each hammer. Yeah. <laughs> Screw it, it'd be faster that way, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so yeah, I, I definitely would need to switch hands in order to reach up to that breach to pop it open. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Okay, here, I got dummies. These oh, are fake. Yep, these are the dummies from the episode. I remember that. Okay, so we just pop we're, those. We're in the episode. We're in the 
episodes. The episode is still happening. I, I forget that it's still happening for them, okay? Loading it in. Uh-huh. All right, I've got my two rounds. It's just two. There ain't <laughs> no more than that. There's no magazine with that, okay? You get one do-over. Yeah, you literally only get one do-over. Okay, I just close the breach. Again, like a Remington rolling block. You just close the breach. You've already cocked the hammer. You're raring to go. Okay. The moment you pull the trigger. But then again, with this one, right one goes down first. I remember correctly. Yep. That is a very heavy pull. And a long one. And a long one at that. The left one, not so much. It's actually a lot lighter. Um, yeah. It's not... I want to say something like 50% lighter, but it's something like 30% lighter, I want to say. How, it's still significant. How much shorter is the travel, though? It's a lot it's a lot shorter travel. Yeah. To me, when I tried shooting it, because I had to, sorry, um, I felt like I would point and I'd start pulling and pulling and pulling and then boom. And it was like, ha, ha, ha. And then I'd go, okay, round two. Boom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, um, so as for the sights themselves, I mean, I'm just looking. It's got the V-notch here in the actual. Um, trough between the trough, barrels. Yeah, trough. I was trying to think of a good way to phrase that. Yeah, no, it's a nice trough right there on the breach, mm -hmm. which is kind of cool. And the front sight, unfortunately, is kind of just a blob. <laughs> so I just kind of went on the basis of the top of the blob. I just lined it in for the bottom of the V-notch back here, which it is a nice, deep, wide set V-notch. I kind of like that. Now, what was your hold on this? The hold on itself? I was just holding high with no, the knuckle. No, no, no. Hold while aiming. What do you mean? Oh, oh, oh. Like I said, I, I literally lined the top of this with the bottom no, of the v -notch. On the target, my dear. Six o'clock, oh. 12 o'clock. Yeah, six o'clock, definitely. Like deep six? Yeah. Because I remember... I remember I had to aim lower on the target than I was anticipating <laughs> because it wants to shoot several inches high. I have no idea. They say they want it to be effective about the 50 meters on the ammo. The first test fire I did on the ammunition for this gun, mm -hmm. we had it set for, I believe, 30 meters. Okay. Or 30 yards. 30 yards. And uh, I remember we we aimed at a center circle on a six-circle target, mm -hmm. you know, one of the generic range target. Yep. I can't even remember which one. But I know that we aimed center of lower circle hit uh, just about center of upper circle because uh -huh. it, was, it was off by... Just a good foot. Yeah, so 30. I was like, ah, I'm just going to aim really deep on the target on that one right. and make sure they all stay there. <laughs> um, but uh, the recoil itself, I felt was uh, not bad, actually. It really wasn't that big of a deal because we really? shot 9.4 before out of those Nagants, the 78s, that right. I remember. Um, so it was, it's like a, a moderate feel to it. So it's not terrible coming out of this one. The only yeah, problem is, is that that banana grip, I'm sliding on it. I really don't have a good solid, uh, knuckle right here. Like I wanted, if it, if it stuck out even just 30% more, mm -hmm. I think that would make a world of a difference in keeping a solid grip on that. Yeah. But once the round's already gone, who care? Because yeah, you're guess. not going to get a follow-up shot without. No, that's true. Well, no, you should get two. You should yeah. actually not have to slip your grip. You're mm -hmm. right. Oh, that is unfortunate. But I, in general, I'm used to having weak knuckles on guns, so I tend to grip pretty firmly to at least get a few shots off without having to adjust my grip. Mm -hmm. so. I'm surprised. I'm surprised the recoil was as mild as it was. Yeah. Because the bore axis looks insane. I know. I thought it was going to be a lot worse. But Here, no, hold your hand terrible. up for the camera. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, I feel like we're in Gasser 1870 territory. Yeah, and just in, in terms, terms of, of the, how far the distance, offset. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty high up there. It's impressive. Mm -hmm. But thankfully, 9.4 is a fairly mild cartridge. It's actually a very low velocity, Which low is mass. Where the recoil balance ought to be kind of moderate. Yeah. Just because of the high bore axis with it. All right. So you are a gendarme. Oh, I'm fancy. Uh, now. Mounted. You have a horsey. Mm -hmm. And it's a very good horsey <laughs> play. Thank you. Don't uh, say that. Okay. <laughs> so, Not that word, no. no. Okay. So then... Uh, <laughs> I'm getting off the horse you have, you have a saddle. Okay. And you have a holster on it for uh -huh. your little two-shot pistol. Yep. You have a saber. Okay. And you have... What a, state was this typically in, by the way? Was it just already chambered with the hammers back? I think shot? the most ready position that they possibly would have carried it in, because I don't think they would have carried it hammers back. Okay. It's probably hammers rebounded on a loaded chamber. Okay. So if you slack those... Mm-hmm. Yep. It's thrilling. <laughs> Can we do some ASMR? Are you, are you pretending uh, that just us lowering and, and cocking hammers? <laughs> Were you pretending that it was chambered? Live? I was. I you're was. Going, okay, I'm gonna do this as if it's well, real. It's also, I just don't like dropping the hammer on old guns in That's general. True. I'm not gonna be I'm gonna baby that. So, well that is a really strong spring too. That's, true. That's terrifying amount of power. Yeah. Uh 
You're on horseback. All right. You have on your saber okay. this thing, and you have a single shot uh, carbine of the Albini Braidland system. Which is that is, on my back? Yeah, presumably. Okay. I didn't, well, it might be a saddle holster. I didn't look into how they carried their carbines. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, yeah, now, anyway. now the, imagine, the imagination is gone. Most people don't know that carbine exists. Anyway, it's it's trapdoor style carbine. Cock okay. the hammer, flip it forward, put the round in. Okay. okay. There's unrest in the town. Okay. Okay. Unrest. Of those weapons, okay. what order would you use them in on a public threat? Well, um... I guess I'd probably go to the carbine first, personally. Okay. Now the carbine's expended. Okay. And there are two angry drunks mm -hmm. with weapons. Mm -hmm. and what kind of weapons? A wolf. Where did they get a wolf? <laughs> I'm just trying to vary the thing. Is this even realistic now? I don't the care. Wolf added? I don't care. You've got your carbine. Okay. You fire one. All right. From horseback. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now what do you do? Do you take the time to reload the carbine? Mm -hmm. Or do you close the distance? Oh, I want this in my right hand, and I want the saber in my left hand. That's awful. That sounds great. I'd put that in my left hand. Why would this go in my left hand? Are you going to use a saber left-handedly? Well, no matter what, I'm coming at them. It's going to be really deadly appearing. Appearing. <laughs> There's the key word. That's what I'm looking for. I'm really asking... Would you bet your life or the lives of some town folks on shooting somebody with that? Not necessarily. <laughs> I'm mostly using this as scare tactics. Okay. I'm expecting this all to fail miserably if any of them test the intimidation on it. Okay. And so to run away on my horse. Yeah, I'm not getting down from my horse. I'm if staying have, on the horse. If you're engaging a dangerous armed man, okay, okay. and you sh shoot at him with that. You get two shots. Yep. How likely is it that you think you're going to actually hit him in the moment of panic? Uh, in the moment of panic, like the the adrenaline is pumping, you you're pulling that trigger, and you have an instant to pull it. Well, mm, okay, not so great. not not great. No. So you hit him with one. Okay. Of these little guys right. that are moving at seven hundred feet per uh, second. He's probably fine, fine enough to keep going unless okay. it was a really so lethal shot. Then you get to try again. And how At least the trigger pulls lighter. How confident are you of hitting him again? Well, not necessarily that right. confident. Yeah. And especially if he's a wolf. If you hit him with both. The wolf might still move. <laughs> <laughs> the wolf probably won't care. It's going to go for the kill. This is an extremely civil pistol. It really is. I think a lot of people survived if they ever got hit by it. <sighs> it looks so cool. Though. That's the thing. You think, oh, it's a Remington rolling block in a pistol form. Oh, that's rad. But then the actual practical use of it, you're like, all of this is stupid. Mm. <laughs> it's just silly. So for my, my purposes... Since you didn't answer the question properly. Okay. I would carbine the wolf because he doesn't know. Wait, so I was supposed to pick which ones I, I did? Yes. Oh, I said I was going to shoot the carbine. I assumed I shot somebody. Okay. Do you want to start over? Well, I assumed the carbine was for shooting someone. Okay. Then... So go in the order. You got two drunk armed idiots okay. and a wolf. Yeah. You have a carbine, that thing, and a sword. Go. Yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm assuming that I'm already available. I'm able to kill them as I please. Like, I'm assuming that's the okay. No, you gotta try. Them. There's a chance that you'll miss and stuff like that. Well, I'm. I'm gonna try the carbine first. Because okay, what are you gonna aim at? Good for long range. I'm probably gonna shoot the dog. Oh, oh. Because I feel oh. like the dog's gonna copying be me. Merciless. It's weird that you had that idea all of a sudden after I. Well, said no, the it. dog's just not gonna care. The dog's gonna go after whoever it cares. Right, because you're not gonna intimidate the dog with that. No. Okay. The dog doesn't care about this. The dog okay, so needs to go down. you drop the wolf. I drop the wolf. And I feel like an Albini braid link carbine could probably do that in one Yeah, bit. all okay. right. And then I'm, the gentlemen at this point have now engaged me. Are and they I'm engaging you or are they standing around going, who shot my dog? Well, they're probably looking and then at you the yell, person. ATF. And then you close the gap. Yes. Okay. And then you have your saber and your pistol. Uh -huh. Which are you going for? I, I still say I still say that I would have the saber in my left and this one in my right. You can't. You have to carry the reins. You can't hold them in your teeth. I, the horse will be fine. No, the you horse only, will do what's going to Your left do. hand has the reins. You have to pick saber or this. I'm probably picking this because this has still got the range that I need. Okay. And then you're going to say, stop. Yeah, stop. And I'm going to point at them. And then if they don't stop, I'm, I guess I'm going to try shooting the most, the burliest looking man. And then you're going to fire twice in the air. Yeah. Why would I fire twice in the air? And then throw it on the ground. And then charge them with the saber. That would be my plan. No! Because it might scare them into giving up if I fire... They know you've got 
two shots, and that's it. All they have to do is wait for you to fire the two. They in don't the know air. that I've got two shots. They haven't seen that thing up close. I just pulled it this out. This is two shots. It's clear, two barrels. <laughs> I mean, okay, I'll take one shot at each of them and then hope that I did something while I then pull my saber and actually do some work. Yes, there you go. That's what you do. Okay. That's the order of operations. God, that should be obvious. <laughs> do you feel better? It's parentheses first. Okay. So, <laughs> you're perfectly equipped to deal with <laughs> one scenario. Yes, one scenario. It's a ridiculous scenario because it is a ridiculous gun, frankly. Now, I have uh, no evidence of this sticking around for the Great War. As a matter of fact, these were sold in the surplus long before the Great War. So they were not part of any sort of behind-the-scenes BS that people want to talk about unless some private citizen happened to have one. Right? Okay, sure. Um, however, mm -hmm. would you take it into something like the Great War? So do I, do I have a rifle and that's my, that's my pistol? No, you're an officer and you have one sidearm. And that's it? Yeah. Um, no, <laughs> no, okay. no, it's... Is there any gun that we've shot in this series that would be worse than this? Hmm. The 1915 revolver wasn't great. In the sense that it might blow up, but it only blow up after a few shots. So I at least would have a few shots more. Rice um, revolver 1879. I would still have several shots with that one. You'd have to work that every time. You at least get two in a row on this one. Yeah. <laughs> boom, boom. But I still have to work. The, I still have to cock both of the hammers on that one. All right. Between this and just a flare gun. I might take the flare gun. <laughs> I might take a flare gun. I just I don't know what scenario that that is going to be relieving to me. It's always going to be horrifying to think that that's what, that would be the one thing that I would be betting my life with. Okay, so you don't like it. I love it. You love it. I personally love whatever that is as yeah. I'm going on with it. This, I'm, I'm not kidding. I just, I see this and I think, oh boy, it's nothing like we've handled for the series before. It is effectively a Remington rolling block in the form of a pistol. It looks wacky and it shoots weird. It's unique, and I've always been a fan of the uniqueness of of the bizarre in this in this series that we have done. But as a shooter, no, it's it's horrible. It sounds like you're telling me that this is one of your favorite guns. It may be. It may be one of my favorite weirdest things we've handled for this series to date. Huh. It really may be. And I'm saying that having shot a lot of machine guns and stuff, <laughs> I guess I'm, I've always just been a fan of just the stupid. <laughs> Which is why I hang out with him. Oh. She could have left it. She could have just made a knowing look, yeah. but she had to play it down. Yeah, I did. Anyway. All what right. about you? May Loves the Nagana, 1870. I think it's adorable. Oh, yeah. It's, I've never seen, well, I can't say I've never seen anything like it because we actually have something on loan that is a lot like it. We do. Uh, but I didn't even, it's so, this is so weird that I didn't realize the other two-barrel pistol that we have on loan mm -hmm. is a two-barrel pistol. Right. The, you put them next to you, and the, the totally different concepts yep. of how to have a two-shot pistol, the end reload. Mm -hmm. And it took me a minute, actually it took me more than a minute, it took me weeks to realize that the other two-barrel pistol we have that's a over-under two-barrel pistol mm -hmm. is essentially this turn sideways. And uh, I would have kept not realizing it because of how different the design aesthetic is. Yeah. So I'm very happy to have it laying around. Me too. I Sorry, it's... I'm just sitting here like observing it, looking it over, and my, I'm <laughs> appreciating the fact that it's stamped everywhere the same serial number. It's kind of nice. Yeah. It's Next a good condition. Numbers. It's a fun. Yeah, I love it. It's great. <laughs> All right. Well, while May admires this piece, yeah. uh, we'll just go ahead and sign off. So y'all have a good one. Thank you, everybody. Was, we had to do the you had to do the thing again where you had to explain. Mm -hmm. uh, be, please be careful. This is a very aggressive guinea pig. I just, I warned them. The vet tech dodged the first bite, not the second though. Yeah, because they always relax. Yeah, they, they relax forget that they it is forget. an actual angry guinea pig. They forget that he's fast too. He's he's fat, but he's quick. So I bought it, swapped everything out, and now I have an all Remington Rand mm -hmm. 1911, which sweet. And then I end up with a spare whole 1911 that is a mix of military and civilian parts. 
low port modification and it's on an Essex frame, which is just a commercial frame nobody really cares much about, right? Mm -hmm. They have those 1911 detachable shoulder stocks of which one I had laying around. I'm going to file a tax stamp. <laughs> so uh, it's been a little while, but you know, I got my favors back and I went and hit David up for the laser. Um, and I now have a SBR in 45 ACP. Yeah. <laughs> takes seven rounds. So I have a stock 1911. And I forgot that that's the day it was showing up. Mm -hmm. So I'm shooting and I come out and one of the guys goes, hey, did you order some cannon wheels or something? And I was like, oh, yeah, but they're not cannon wheels. But yeah, I forgot, you know. Mm -hmm. And he goes, yeah, I was like, oh, did it have my name on it? And he goes, oh, we didn't even look. And I went, what? <laughs> he said, yeah, we, we they showed up and they were heavy as sin and we popped one of them open to see what the heck was going on. And they knew because it's some old crap. It's just brass, I think, or iron. I can't remember what they're made of, but mm -hmm. they're heavy as sin. And uh, it's like giant pizza boxes that weigh 100 pounds, you know? Yeah. Um, and <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, my name. He goes, no, you were just here and these are weird. The whole system is gas sealed at the rear. There is no gas coming out the back here. We are keeping 100% of our gas pressure on the bullet moving down the bore. That's gonna make it accelerate even faster. We're gonna get higher muzzle velocity. 